807 Nashville's Morning News on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Welcome on in. Along with Johnny B, Ken Weaver, Dan Mandis here, and Phil Williams from News Channel 5 is joining us in the studio. Phil, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much for coming in. Good morning. It's a pleasure. So I, one of the first things I wanted to ask you, and I mentioned in the previous hour, you know, I, I was going through <clears throat> all of the hijinks and shenanigans that went down yesterday at the state capitol. Right. With, you've got Justin Jones calling uh, Lambert a racist, and it's all of it. It is so dysfunctional. Do you enjoy reporting on this stuff, or does it just become a chore? Uh, both. <laughs> I mean, there are times, certainly, that uh, I, I, I'm a nerd. I, I love watching the the machinations of uh, the legislative process but then there are times that it the dis- dysfunction just keeps repeating itself mm-hmm. to the point that you know you know yesterday when all of that went down i was in the gallery working on another story and i think my immediate re- reaction was geez you know here we go again it's got to get on the one hand, it's a target-rich environment for an investigative reporter such as yourself. Would you say the news and the divisiveness uh, here in Tennessee is getting worse? It, it is. Uh, I was talking with uh, several long-timers yesterday around the Capitol. Uh, it is as toxic of an environment as I've ever seen, and I've been covering the Capitol for you know 30 years. Um, back when the, uh, the, the Dems were in charge and had a super majority, it was toxic. But back in those days, it, it was toxic between parties. Now you have this inter, intra party, uh, toxicity as well. There, there are people within the Republican party that are stabbing each other in the back. There, there's dysfunction within the Democratic party. I mean, right now, Justin Jones, uh, has a lot of detractors within his own party, people who wish that he would change his tactics. And, and so on that level, it is more toxic than I have ever witnessed. You know, when it comes to Justin Jones, I think, and I've said this many times, it's like the only thing that he does these days is scream racist. I mean, the the audio from yesterday, William Lambert, you're a racist, you're a racist. And it's like that's all you ever hear of Justin Jones. And I think that that is to the detriment of, you know, either both parties working together or even the Democrats being able to, you know, really function within the state legislature. There are uh, moderate Republicans uh, who I have spoken with who say that their experience has been that there may be a piece of legislation that they are not fond of, that they would like to see killed. But when comments like that are made on the floor, they see the votes going in the opposite direction. People saying, I'm just going to vote against Justin Jones because of the, the, the tactics. Yeah. And, and, you know, to be fair, to be clear, there are people within the Democratic Party who feel the same way. Uh, and, uh, you know, Representative Jones would say, you know, he's fighting the good fight. He's calling out racism where he sees it. But there are uh, also people within his own party that wish he would dial it back. Well, because they're there to do a job. And ultimately, I think that it's hard to do a job when you have those those kinds of just incendiary vitriolic insults being hurled, you know, in one direction from Justin Jones. And it's always he's screaming at the Republicans and the whole Ku Klux Cameron thing that was also going on from the gallery yesterday. It's just, as I said during the one of my monologues earlier today, it is like a, a really bad or a really good reality show. I'm not sure which one. We had a moment yesterday. <clears throat> Scott Sapicki was on with Matt Murphy, state rep Scott Sapicki, and everyone knows he is one of the driving forces behind Governor Lee's uh, want for school choice. And so there was a moment where, because you've been on the front lines of this discussion as far as the reporting goes, I, I've covered it extensively on, on my show and others have covered it as well. But there was a moment, you, you had a story the other day where you had one of your infamous Phil Williams recordings 
And it was Scott Sapicki basically saying something to the effect of he wants to you know, blow up education in the state of Tennessee. And effectively what he was saying was he wants to fix it. And and so, as he said yesterday, he probably could have been a little more artful in the way that he said it. But Matt asked Scott this question about your reporting. Do you feel like Phil Williams of News Channel 5 has been uh, an honest and fair player in this debate? Phil's a great guy. Do you feel like he gave you a fair shake in this article to speak what you know to be true about your position on this issue? No. And if he's been paying attention to the last six years, he should know me pretty well by now about where I am. Your thoughts? Uh, th- that is absolutely not true. Uh, I texted Scott at 455 on Saturday and told him that we had a recording and gave him an outline of what I anticipated would be the high highlights of that, that recording. Uh, I asked if we could talk about the recording uh, that we were planning to do a story that would break Monday morning. So this was a 36 hour notice, essentially. And and I asked him if we could talk. I have Republican leaders throughout the state who will return my phone call if I you know say I'm doing a story and I want to give you a chance to respond. He did. He never responded to me personally at all. He had a uh, Republican caucus uh, spokesperson call and say he'll do an interview with you if you'll hold the story. And I was like, that's not how this works. You don't get to decide when we break the story. But I do want to give you a chance to respond. And and uh, we we had a, a text exchange that went on for several hours. Uh, and the person was saying, well, he's, he wants to do an on camera interview with you. And I said, great. We'll do a zoom interview this weekend. He can just name the time. We'll do a zoom interview. They chose not to do that. I even texted and said, would he like to give us a statement, a written statement? I really want to get his side. So he had 36 hours notice. He could have responded in whatever form he chose. And in fact, after the story ran, I saw him uh, in the hallways of the Cordell Hall building where the legislature has its committee meetings and has its offices. And I said, Scott, let's talk about what happened. He refused to even acknowledge my presence. So I did everything I could. The decision not to respond, the decision not to give his side of the story was his and his alone. News Channel 5's Phil Williams is uh, joining me in studio. And, and just so folks know, I've been trying to get Phil in here for, I mean, 10 years, I, I think. It's been, it's been a long time. So I, I very much appreciate uh, you being here. You get, you get this rap these days as somebody who is always targeting Republicans. And you're always, you know, targeting, you know, people on the right. You don't like MAGA folks and, and so on and so forth. What is your response to that? Well, but back when the uh, Democrats had a supermajority, I was accused of being a closet Republican. And in fact, I was uh, on uh, talk radio with, you know, Steve Gill and Phil sure. Valentine back yeah. in those days. Uh, and the, the, the Dems just were sure that I was a closet Republican. The, the same thing goes here. He, here. Here's the deal. My job is to investigate those in power. Well, who's in power these days? It's a super majority where you have a Republican governor. You have uh, 80% or 82%, I forget, of the Senate is Republican. Uh, I think like 76% of the House is Republican. And so the, the people with the real power in this state right now are Republicans. And so I tend to... To go there because that's where the power is. Uh, the, you know, Democrats have very little power in the state right now. And I'm sure your audience would like to keep it. You know, a lot of <laughs> you, your audience would like to keep it that way. But that's not to say that I don't investigate Democrats when I find a clear story. Uh, for example, we were talking about Justin Jones earlier. Uh, at, at the end of last session, 
I did a, a story about the fact that, remember, there was this pushing match uh, oh, I remember. B- between Cameron Sexton and Justin Pearson and Justin yep. Jones. Yep. Uh, and and I did a story about the lack of civility and, like we were talking about earlier, how even members of the Democratic Party were not happy with the, the Justins. Uh, and, and, and basically the thesis with the, of the story, which, you know, the Tennessee Holler hated and other progressives hated, was that this clash would never have happened had the Justins not been getting in the speaker's face and getting into his, his space. Um, I, I have done stories about uh, Nashville's Democratic DA, Glenn Funk. Uh, I did investigations of Gideon's Army uh, uh, here in Nashville, which progressives hated. So if, if I get a clear um, investigation of abuse of power by Democrats, you can bet I will be doing that story. That's my, my, my question. How do you decide on what kind of story that you go after? Yeah, for, first of all, uh, I, I, I say the threshold, you know, tier one uh, story is something that's illegal or unethical. And and again, that's where, you know, those type of stories tend to go to the people with power because the, the people without power don't have the ability to do, you know, no bid contracts, that type of thing. Uh, I, I think the next level would be lying uh, or hypocrisy. Uh, you know, in the last couple of years, we've really focused a lot on the legislature. Uh, Airbnb had legislation to uh, affect Nashville's ability to regulate short term rentals, which is fine. I don't have a dog in that hunt, but they were not telling the truth about what their bill did. And so in, in a in a situation like that, where you have people going before legislative committees and lying about what their bill does, that's going to be a story for me. Uh, also, and, and this is true with, you know, school vouchers, money. I, I want to follow the money. And if there's a lot of big money coming into the state uh, and saying we're going to eliminate any politician who doesn't vote our way, then I'm going to be following that story as well. So it's 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 lying, it's you know unethical, uh, it's it's money, and and more generally, just anything that people in power don't want the public to know. Hey Phil, this is Ken Weaver, and it's a pleasure meeting you. But uh, this question is kind of more on the lines of all uh, TV investigative reporters. Are are you guys tasked with like a certain number of reports you guys have to come up with? You know, is 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 that how you guys operate? I, I can only speak for our news operation, and the answer is uh, absolutely not. Uh, we we often talk about the the most important investigations that we do are the ones that never make the air, uh, because you know we we may spend days, weeks on a story and finally decide, hey, that's not what we thought it was, mm. and we have. We, it is very much emphasized with us. We will walk away from any story that we don't think you know, meets our standards. Gotcha. The story on social media, uh, a woman named, uh, I think her name is Janisha Harris, posted on Facebook that Justin Jones saw a homeless man sexually assault two women who were down at the Capitol protesting the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest inside the Capitol. Two different assaults. One guy, several witnesses, including Jones, apparently. Now, this woman, Janisha Harris, she claims that Jones told her not to report it because that incident would overpower the advocacy of what was going on regarding the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Now, the question is, number one, do you know about the story? And number two... Is that the kind of story that you would investigate? And if the answer is no, why not? Absolutely. I do know about the story. I did know about the story when it was posted. Uh, And, you know, one one of your colleagues has said, you know, Justin Jones has been credibly accused. Here's why I don't buy into that. Number one, uh, the, the person who made that comment, I attempted to reach her. She never responded. And so all we have, all anyone has, as far as I know, is this social media post. Now, the other thing is, at the bottom of her post, she mentions that she is out of town. 
So she did not personally witness this. This is secondhand or thirdhand reporting on her part. She was not there. She is not a witness. Um, and in her post, she mentions that there were multiple other people who were there and who were witnesses. So, number one, she, she's not a firsthand witness. So, in my mind, that's not enough to accuse someone of covering up a sexual assault. Uh, number two, there were other people there who could have, you know, other adults who could have called the police uh, and apparently did not. And the, the third thing is she mentions in that post that she actually doesn't trust the police. Right. Uh, and in talking, again, second and third hand, as as I tried to figure out what was going on with this story, uh, one person told me that they really th- this is a group that doesn't believe in involving the police if if, if possible. And so they wanted to do something. Uh, and it was it's a term related to restorative justice. Uh, uh, it was a different term that was given to me. But basically, they wanted to sit down as a first step with the perpetrator and tell him about the harm that he had caused and kind of reach a resolution. Uh, so, okay. I, I, again, you know, in, in my mind, you know, that that's not a group of people that was just dying to call the police. Again, if someone were to go on the record and ex- someone with firsthand knowledge, yes, I would do that story if, if he indeed did cover up a sexual assault. We just don't know enough right now. We don't have solid enough evidence. All we have is a social media post by someone who was not there. Has anybody asked Justin Jones about this? Like, I, I know that uh, there's been some people poking him on social media. I mean, is that the kind of thing where it would be appropriate for you to ask him? I, I did ask him, and because this deals with a someone with whom he was involved in a relationship, he he chose not to comment. But I am not going to go on the air with a story without some solid evidence. And right now, if we're being honest, there is not solid evidence. There is a Facebook post by someone who wasn't there, and that's all we have. If there were people who did there were several witnesses so if somebody did come forward that would at the very least give you the opportunity to find a trail exactly that's what you need but my question also would be okay you're an adult why didn't you call the police and she said in her post that she doesn't like uh involving police and i don't know i don't think she likes police generally speaking anyway right and so this is the kind of me talking this kind of crowd that we're dealing with so well, we'll see if there's any updates on that. If, if people know any witnesses that saw this, I think it's, you know, Phil, you sound like you're perfectly willing and, and able, certainly, to uh, investigate this if there is more information other than what we currently see. If anyone has covered up sexual assault, I don't care who they are. I, I would be all of, all over that story if we had solid evidence. Megan Barry, former yes. mayor. We all know what happened. From a, a, a human side, you are seeing people at sometimes the worst part of their career, maybe their life, perhaps their personal life as well. When these kinds of stories happen, like a Megan Barry, we all know what happened. Is there part of you, what is your feeling going into, for example, the interview with Megan Barry? She's just announced that she's having had this affair taxpayer dollars basically essentially funding the affair and you get the interview first interview after she's made this announcement what is your feeling when you go into there is it like oh man i got to talk to this lady at the worst moment moment of her life yeah and from the clip that you played earlier you can tell i'm very slow and very deliberate uh in in my questions just because i felt the weight of the moment well one of the things that has always stuck with me and when I was a young reporter, a, a, a print reporter at the Tennessean, uh, I was investigating the Secretary of State uh, for Tennessee, Gentry Crowell, a, a Democrat. Uh, and um, Mr. Crowell, uh, unfortunately, ended up uh, committing suicide during that investigation. Uh, and so I am always mindful of the, the fact that I'm dealing with human beings, that I'm dealing with you know, broken people often. 
Uh, and so I never take those moments for granted. Um, Megan Barry actually might have been able to avoid that scandal uh, had she not decided just to come clean and confess because there were certainly rumors about the relationship. At that point in time, no one, not myself included, had actual evidence that they were engaged in a sexual relationship. Um, and she decided to try to get ahead of the story. Uh, I don't know if we would have been able to, you know, piece together all the elements to be able to do a story. But the fact that she was willing to come clean and admit that, you know, she had messed up, you know, I, I, I felt the, the gravity of the moment because especially, you know, when a story involves family members, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just so mindful of, you know, the, as the, uh, you know, doctors and the Hippocratic oath, you know, first do no harm. Uh, and if, if I can avoid it, I really do not want to do anything to harm innocent people who may be on the sidelines of these stories. You'd made mention of of person who had committed suicide. Has there ever been a story that you've regretted that you thought? Ah. Not that I can think of off the top of my head, uh, because I tried never to go with a story unless I feel confident about it. Yep. Yep. There was there was a this is one of my favorite stories, actually, uh, one of my favorite videos. You go to the <laughs> Davidson County Clerk's office and you're trying you're trying to uh, figure out why it is that that state employees uh, or county employees are gambling. And so you walk in and this lady is just, oh, yeah, we're just gambling and these are gambling machines. And, you know, you're trying to figure out, OK, but what exactly is going on? And and some big dude shows up and tries to shove you out the door. So what's the point of putting in, are these tokens? Yeah. So what do you win? I think if you get three sevens, you get like five dollars. So Our search for answers quickly took a dramatic turn. No, we need you out of the break room. <laughs> Why? Because I said so. And who are you? Let's go, Phil. Who are you? I believe you already asked him his name. Let's go. Oh, don't let's go. Don't get rough with me, sir. Let's go. This is public property. Get out. Please do not touch me. But, and and, and the, the the camera stops right when it looks like you're about ready to clock the guy. And um, what did you do? Did you just okay? I'm going. Or what happened after the? The camera stopped. Yeah, I, I continued uh, going out the door. In fact, uh, uh, if you watch the video, I was actually on my way out the door when he shoved me in the back. And that's when I turned around. It's like, what the heck? Yeah. Um, but, you know, that that was just such a bizarre day. Um, the the uh, man who uh, did the shoving was dressed as a leprechaun, had a leprechaun cap on. Uh, and uh, and and he uh, he took off his his leprechaun cap and handed it to his friend. Before he started shoving me, so the, I, I think instead the, of hold my beer, it's hold my leprechaun cap. And and so the uh, the life lesson from that is, if a leprechaun takes off his cap, it's going down. <laughs> That's funny, actually. You've been in some. You, know, you mentioned earlier Gideon's Army. Right now, I, that seems to be one of the more. I mean, for me, that was great investigative reporting. For folks who don't know what Gideon's Army is or was, I don't even know if they're still around. But they were one of these organizations, and their stated mission was to be violence interrupters, trying to take care of the streets, trying to keep kids out of gangs, and so on and so forth. But there is some corruption involved in, in Gideon's Army. And if I remember right, there are some criminals actually involved in Gideon's Army. They're all about, on the surface, talking about how you know laws need to be obeyed, I guess. And uh, it turns out that that's not what this organization was about. On the heels of, you know, the leprechaun shoving you out of the uh, clerk's office, it, during that investigation, were you nervous about maybe your own uh, safety? Uh, the, there were moments I had an encounter uh, with um, w one of the individuals involved. Uh, l luckily, uh, it was uh, at federal court uh, where I uh, People had gone through security, and there were there was lots of security around. But one of the one of the individuals involved in that uh, just started following me down a hallway, shouting at me, daring me to to engage with him. 
Uh, and so that, that was certainly an uncomfortable moment, but you know, that, that's sort of just become part of the job now. Um, my, I, I've been married uh, now seven years, and my wife tells me I did not adequately prepare her for what it was like <laughs> to be in my world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. you, you, your wife and my wife would probably have a conversation. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, when, when you go through all of these different stories, how many of the stories do you actually – because you get tips, right? I mean, that's that's generally speaking one of the ways in which you choose your stories. You get tips, and then the process of figuring out, you know, if you want to pursue a story or not. How many stories are left on the on the table? Well, um, I I never quite walk away from a story until I'm absolutely convinced there's nothing to it. I I have, and, and immediately comes to mind one story that I've been working on now for probably four or five years and I still have the box box of uh, records in my office because uh, I'm very close to connecting the dots but not quite and um, it would involve um, high level corruption uh, and you know I, I would say probably half of the stuff I work on doesn't turn out and turn into stories just because we, we, you know, cannot connect every single dot to be able to confidently go on the air and accuse someone of, you know, breaking the law or doing something unethical. Has there ever been a time where you wanted to go with a story and, I don't know, the editors or whoever it is says, no, we don't, we don't have enough? What, what are the safeguards? Uh, it, well, it's a collaborative process. I mean, we, uh, I, I'm always talking with, uh, you know, my colleagues, uh, my supervisor about, you know, where we are on various investigations. And then, uh, like with, you know, most, you know, major media corporations, we have, you know, corporate counsel that, you know, if there's any question, we'll, that we'll consult with. And so we, we have lots of safeguards. But, you know, number one is, you know, based on my years of experience, you know, I tend to know whether I've, I've, I've got it locked up or not. Okay. Um, this has gone so fast. State of journalism today. You got into this, what, 30, 35 years ago? Something like that. So <laughs> I don't want to count. <laughs> has journalism, this is a generic question, um, and a few folks that are, would accuse me of softballing, this is a softball. Has journalism changed a lot over the past 35, 40 years? I think the biggest issue that we're seeing is the fragmentation of uh, the the audience, uh, and therefore, as a result, there are fewer journalists out there doing the job. Um, an example that your audience will be familiar with is uh, Gabrielle Henson, uh, and 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 that one became just an explosive story, but I almost missed it. Someone put me on to one element of it. And then as I started digging in, um, you know, I, I found just all sorts of, you know, problems with her past, with, you know, some of her claims. Uh, but I think, you know, had I not gotten involved, she would be the mayor of Franklin today. But that story almost missed me. It almost missed everyone. How did you almost miss it? I'm curious. Like, just, just be, it wasn't on your radar. It, it wasn't on my radar, and you know, there's just not a, enough of me to investigate everything that I would like to investigate, and there's not enough of you know reporters on on our team to investigate everything that we would like to investigate. All right, I've uh, got I've, I've got one one more, uh, and I just I found this uh, really fascinating, and that was uh, Michael Shamblin. Now, mm -hmm. for for me, I was not around when that original story was going on. But uh, this was you had a very contentious relationship with the Shamblin family and uh, Michael Shamblin, uh, Gwen Shamblin's son, reached out to you years after your original reporting on their church. Twenty years ago, would you ever have imagined that you and I would be sitting down talking like this? Phil, 20 years ago, early on in Remnant, you were the devil. The devil. Oh, yes. You were Satan incarnate to the remnant early on. And then you guys just reconnected. And I, I thought that was fascinating because obviously you were, as he said, the devil incarnate. Uh, then his mom dies in that plane crash. And he reaches out to you 
and kind of basically realized that your reporting on the church was true and it was actually something as he looked back on he realized that he was a little too harsh on you and and that's a a good example of what we were talking about earlier with treating people as human beings uh after his mother died i sent him a little message of condolence you know sorry to hear about your mother uh and then later after his his dad died i just acknowledged you know his loss and and so that was how the door was opened just treating him as a human being uh and and he came around and decided that um i had been right and that he was ready to tell his story and he wanted to tell me his story and so but again you know despite my reputation um, I really do try to pe- treat people as human beings, even if they've been the subject of investigations. I I had lunch last week with a couple of people that I was involved with sending to prison. Uh, wow. B- because they are human beings. And, you know, it. I believe in redemption. I really do believe in redemption. And if someone has messed up and is willing to acknowledge it, I, 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 I'm willing to be your friend. Favorite story ever? Oh, favorite story ever, uh, probably is our policing for prop, for profit investigation, civil asset forfeiture, yep. uh, where you, that. where you had drug interdiction units of in the, in the Dixon area, uh, stopping, uh, cars, mainly out of state vehicles, mainly people of color, taking cash just based on the suspicion that it was drug money and hoping that the people, you know, in some cases would not have the money to hire lawyers and come back and, and argue for their cash. Uh, that, that has resulted in some modest reforms in the legislature. Uh, it, my, my favorite story about that is, um, there, there was a television drama on CBS called The Good Wife. Uh, and one night I was watching and, um, the, they had an episode about civil asset forfeiture. And, and the lead, uh, attorney in, or the lead character in the story is cross examining this drug interdiction agent. And she's saying, there, you have 10 times as many stops on the money side of the interstate that you do on the drug side. You're not interested in, in stopping the drugs. You just want the money. And I was like, that is straight out of my investigation because that was one of the points, 10 times wow. as many stops. Uh, and so I reached out to CBS uh, the, the next morning and they said, yes, our investigation had been the the genesis for that episode of The Good Wife. No kidding. So right, that, that well, was kind of cool. Thank you very much for coming in. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully we haven't scared you away and you'll come back. Sounds good to me. All right. Very good. You heard that. It's a commitment. Appreciate you listening to Super Talk, 99.7 WTN.